Thank you all so much for coming to our NEH grant workshop this morning. We're delighted that so many people showed up. Um, this is great. We have a wonderful day with Russ Weiland from NEH, and I just wanted to um, welcome you and to let you know that this is a co-sponsored program with a number of different departments on campus. Uh, from the Vice Provost for Research Office, we have Jesse Zito, Office of Scholarly Publications, Carol Sargent, and me um, on behalf of the library. So I would just uh, like now to introduce Billy Jack, our Vice Provost for Research, who will introduce the program for you. <laughs> Hi, good morning everyone. This is a real pleasure. Someone closed the blinds. I was looking forward to looking out on the view as I spoke. Yeah. Not that you're not in, you know, entertaining. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, the Murray Room here at, uh, in the, at the Lounger Library at Georgetown. It's really a uh, delight for me to see such a great turnout, both of faculty, thanks for coming, you guys, and from uh, representatives from the NEH and NEA. Um, I want to first uh, thank Russell Weiland from the NEH and Amy Stoltz from the NEA for being kind of the drivers with our team here on Georgetown, at Georgetown in organizing this event. And on the subject of the team from Georgetown, let me again recognize Jesse Sito from my office uh, and Carol Sargent from the Office of Scholarly Publications. And Meg was a little bit uh, understated there. Meg Oakley and Emily Minton from the library for putting this all together. I know it's been a lot of work and uh, it's, it's greatly appreciated. I have done identically zero work in putting this together so they get uh, all of the credit uh, for doing so. Um, also a special welcome to the NEH Director of Research, uh, Chris Thornton. Uh, there. Hi Chris. Um, and various other uh, staffers from the NEH. I won't go through the list, there's quite a number of you. Uh, and um, Jessica Flynn from the NEA, I believe is not here yet, but will be later on in the day. And other uh, representatives from the National Endowment of the Arts. So, uh, my job is to, what, what is it, like set the scene, set the tone for the day. Uh, so, let me, I, I was thinking about, so what's the tone? Um, and the, the context, at least, is that we're here at Georgetown, which is a traditionally liberal arts college. Right? We've been around for a while. We've been teaching students stuff for a long time now. But we're also, uh, we are, I'll use the current uh, tense of the verb, but we also aspire to be a modern research university. And um, so we're gonna, we mix a, a dedication to teaching and the formation of, of what we call the whole person here at Georgetown, Cura Personalis, um, with a commitment to discovery of some kind, and discovery in the sense of research. So discovery of what, you might ask, and the natural uh, answer to that is, well, it's truth. It's a bit of a, an easy answer, because then you know, our philosophy department has been working hard on deciding exactly what that is. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, the essence of discovery I would claim is not just finding stuff out, but creation as well. We can create new knowledge, that's kind of the discovery of truth in some sense, but you know, in some uh, sense, the creation of beauty itself. And uh, I know it's a cliche, right? a, an overused one, but <coughs> truth and beauty certainly are two sides of the same coin, from you know, Galileo and Newton on the one hand, to Mozart and Keats on the other, you know, all of them back in the day were considered to be doing kind of the same thing in the, in the academy, that is the creation of beauty. So the arts and humanities then are naturally essential components of this university's research mission, I would claim. And it's appropriate to include funding for these things uh, and measures of activity in the arts and humanities in uh, an overview of our research portfolio. If we think that creativity and exploring the nature of art and humanity 
is part of research. So if you want, I, I'm a numbers guy, right? I'm, I'm an economist, uh, an evil person. Uh, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you want to get down to the dirty, rotten numbers, uh, we, uh, Georgetown, uh, spends about $220 million on R&D uh, this year. We, with that number comes from a, a report we submit uh, uh, as part of the so-called HERD uh, process. 17% um, of our submissions uh, for external grants are in the social sciences, humanities, and languages, and that. Um, so we try hard. 10% uh, of our funded awards are in those areas. So we try hard, but we actually aren't quite as good as we might be if you want to compare those two numbers directly. Um, so we'd like to get better at getting awards. And in some sense, that's why we're here today, is to talk to two important funders in this area about what we can do better. And if we can do it better, we'd like to do more of it as well. And so, um, you know, we all hate talking about money. Well, I hate talking about money. But in a sense, <laughs> if we're to really achieve this goal of being a creative research institution, then we need to uh, find ways of financing ourselves. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all here to engage in that conversation so that we can just find out how to do our job better. So with that, I want to welcome you finally to the day. I'm just so impressed that we've been able to set this up with two sessions uh, spaced with food because <laughs> that ensures that at least some people stay at the end of the first session and some people get here at the beginning of the session. It's a great organizational strategy. Uh, I'd like to then now ask uh, Jesse to uh, lead us through the agenda for the day and, um, and then we can kick off. Thank you so much again for coming. Well, welcome everyone. So we're going to start off with the morning session from the National Endowment of the Humanities. And that will be a presentation by Dr. Wyman. Uh, and then it'll be followed by a Q&A session. Now at the same time, I think he will also encourage you, don't hold your questions all the way to the end. It doesn't have to be quite so formal as that. Ask your questions during the presentation. Um, this will then be followed by uh, lunch, uh, which all of you are invited to stay for. And then in the afternoon, we'll have the uh, representatives from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, who will be coming. Um, they will also give a presentation and do a Q&A session. Uh, now, one thing I want to make sure that you understand is that part of the way that we're trying to do this is to make it as interactive as possible. So please don't just listen to the lecture, but interact to it. I think most of you would have also received our uh, survey question before, which is to ask, what are the questions that you have beforehand? If some of you responded to that, thank you very much. <laughs> For those of you who were shy, well, don't be shy today. Uh, so this is the time to ask the questions. There are two other things that I want to remind you and also to our folks who are viewing this, uh, is that this is being recorded. So if you have other folks that you know who were not able to make it today, I know a number of folks in the English department were, were not able to make it today in person please let them know, and we will send it out to all the faculty members that the recordings are going to be available on YouTube. Um, thank you to the NEH and to NEA for letting us record you. Um, and then also, I wanted to ask for the faculty members and the researchers who are here from Georgetown, we are interested in doing future workshops like this. So if you have additional funding agencies, foundations that you're interested in coming, please let us know and we'll try to organize something like this in the future. And then the final thing that I want to announce is that for those of you who are interested in getting an additional workshop, one hour or uh, session or so on how to write a proposal, how to change your idea from a proposal idea into an actual proposal and how to match it up to the most appropriate funding opportunity, we have access to a third party called Hanover Research who has offered to meet with folks who are self-identified and want to meet with them and share with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis what your proposal ideas are. So we'll ask you to sign up for that, if you will. Uh, you can sign up with that with me 
And we'll also send out a survey afterwards to ask you if you want to sign up for that. So just keep those two things in mind. So if there are additional funding agencies, foundations that you want us to organize, let us know about that. And or if you want to meet with Hanover Research, let us know about that too. So without further ado, Dr. White. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out uh, today to uh, see this little presentation on NEH. Uh, before I start, uh, Dr. Jack, thank you very much. Uh, and I don't uh, 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 normally expect uh, uh, an, an economist to mention Keats and Newton. And, uh, and so uh, that does my heart good. Um, uh, I think you, you might be a humanist at heart. Uh, um, thanks also uh, to Carol, who uh, really made this possible. Uh, I met her uh, several years ago at one of these um, at Catholic U, and uh, she's kept after me these many years to do something mm -hmm. here. And uh, I'm sorry it's taken so long, but thank you, Carol, for doing that. Uh, and Jesse and Meg and Emily for putting everything together. Thank you so much. So we have about an hour and 45 minutes, and we have a fair amount of material to get through. Um, but I don't think it's so much that you can ask questions as we go, so please feel free to do that. Uh, we're going to be divide this in half, uh, time-wise, I hope. Uh, the first half will be uh, about NEH and to let you know what NEH has to offer. Uh, and so we'll look across uh, all, of our, all of our programs. The second half then, we will talk uh, more specifically about what uh, a competitive application looks like at NEH. Um, <clears throat> and I've brought some handouts to help. Um, if you didn't pick up a humanities magazine, this is arguably the most important thing um, you can leave here uh, with uh, this after or this, uh, later today. Um, <clears throat> one, it's just a great piece of reading. It's it's, um, I, it's it makes me proud to be at NEH every time I uh, pick it up every every two months. Um, <clears throat> but on the inside back cover. Uh, are all the deadlines, all the programs, contact numbers, email addresses. So uh, you can write madly what, during my presentation, or you can just get this when you're done reading it. When you're done reading it, tear off the, the back cover uh, and stick it to your bulletin board uh, by your computer. Uh, and then you always have dates. Contact, contact information, okay? Um, so uh, if anyone wants to get up in the middle and grab one of these, that's fine. And I should say, um, we're, we're sort of in a, a sort of formal, uh, sort of nice, nice straight lines and whatnot, but feel free to get up, refresh your coffee. Um, there should be, there's really nothing formal uh, about what we're doing here. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe, why don't, why don't okay. I just hand them around? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize I was called a run on the magazine. I know. Yeah. 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 All right. So, well, uh, while you all uh, uh, pull together uh, that material, let me just see here. I guess I can't move that, so. Um, so let's talk a little bit uh, to start with uh, about what NEH is. Uh, how many of you have actually interacted with NEH in some way? Um, you've gotten a grant, submitted something, okay. So a, a third of you, maybe. Um, so let me just remind uh, everyone who has applied or has interacted uh, with us what we are and hopefully uh, say something that will maybe uh, enlighten the rest of you uh, about what NEH does. NEH is a federal agency 
founded in 1965-66. It was one of the great society uh, programs to support all areas of the humanities through project-based grants and fellowships using merit-based peer review. I wrote that uh, as sort of a, a summary. Let's talk about, uh, there are a few things that really uh, are important there. Um, it matters that we are, federal, that we are uh, a federal agency. Uh, it matters not only because uh, it says something, as you know, many of you know from your email, about where we get our money. Uh, and I realize that you know, every, uh, it seems to be sort of a rite of spring. Uh, to put out uh, that there are panic calls go out over email uh, about our budget. Um, this year we have $155 million um, to give away. And, and so uh, we have uh, our, uh, even though um, the, I think now the last three years the administration has uh, put in for, um, to zero us out, um, Congress uh, has um, given us a raise each of the last two years, so we're, we're doing fine, uh, and we have money to give away. And that's a really important message because a lot of times I think some of the, the sort of buzz out there scares away applicants. Um, so you should know that we are open for business uh, and we're making a lot of grants. Um, <clears throat> But the fact that we get money from Congress means that we're actually getting money from you. Um, uh, about uh, the, the cost of a first, uh, first class stamp is what it costs you to have the NEH around. Uh, and uh, we are therefore responsible to you, and we take that responsibil responsibility very, very seriously at NEH uh, with um, how, much, uh, how, we, how we treat the money. Um, so we're very, uh, we're always aware uh, how uh, important it is that we spend the taxpayers' money, your money, wisely. Um, it means you get some things for what, because you pay into the system, you do get something out of the system. Um, help is always available to you. Um, there are uh, 140 people who work at NEH right now or so. Um, we are hired to help you access the money. Um, that is available uh, to people who are working in the humanities. So you should never feel uh, nervous about coming to us, either by email, by phone, uh, and talking to us about your project. Most of the people who work uh, at NEH uh, are, uh, are themselves uh, have a background in whatever it is that they're doing. My background, I have a PhD in uh, Victorian literature. Um, Chris back there, he's an ar archaeologist. We have several others um, uh, in the division of research <clears throat> that cover sort of the gamut of, um, of uh, the humanities. <clears throat> um, so we're available uh, by email, by phone. Uh, we run webinars uh, as our application uh, materials become available. Uh, since we're close neighbors, we're just down at the Font Plaza, you can always uh, uh, stop in and visit. Uh, all of those things work for us. Uh, because we're a federal uh, agency, uh, you have a right to privacy. So if you submit an application, uh, that is uh, considered private. No one will ever know uh, that you've done so. If you win, however, uh, your name uh, then becomes a, a part of, because you're receiving public money, uh, your name becomes uh, public. It also means that we, uh, because you pay into the system, you have a right to transparency. So we're going to make sure that if you give us your good ideas uh, and they go through uh, our review process, that you have access at the end of that process to understand what happened to your application, the discussions had about it, um, the, the ideas, um, how uh, panelists wrestled, evaluators wrestled with the ideas that you presented. So you can simply ask us for feedback uh, and we will provide it. You also have um, a right to information. 
So if you want to see, if it would be useful for you to see applications that have been previously funded, we are happy to do that and provide those uh, to you. Uh, we try to give you a lot of other information on our website uh, that will help you put together uh, a better application. Uh, I should say uh, you also have the opportunity to help, uh, to help us do our work. And uh, so we use 100%, uh, we have 100% turnover in our um, evaluator pool every year. Uh, we're always looking for new evaluators, so if you want to improve your grant writing, there's really no better way to do it than read a stack of 40 applications or 35 applications. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a place where you can go on our website, uh, on the homepage, and uh, sign up for that. Uh, and so I encourage all of you to do that. Or if you'd like to talk to me after, if you're interested, please let me know. So uh, we fund in all areas of the humanities. And uh, most of you will probably know that uh, we have been arguing uh, for probably 2,000 years about what's actually in the humanities. <laughs> and so to say that, um, that NEH uh, funds the humanities is, is not so self-evident. But in 1965, Congress was quite certain that they had the answer uh, to this 2,000-year-old question. <laughs> Uh, and um, so into our legislation, uh, they put uh, the following, uh, they listed uh, the following things as, as humanity. So history, literature and language, history and theory of the arts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds in, in some ways like a, a, depart a list of departments at any college or university. Um, this is our starting point, okay? So the kinds of things that we fund at NEH uh, might start here, but obviously we know work is very interdisciplinary now, both within the humanities, but then also we fund a good deal of work uh, where the humanities brushes up against uh, medicine, uh, against uh, engineering, uh, against uh, biology, all sorts, economics, so he's, he's slipped away, okay. Um, so there is, um, uh, this is a starting point, and that's how we regard the list that, uh, that Congress has given us. It's as a starting point, because we know the humanities is a dynamic thing. It's changing all the time, and the, kind, the people who are doing the work are, are also um, uh, always sort of pushing, uh, pushing out. <coughs> One of the interesting things here is a lot of times people don't realize is that, that the social sciences are actually included as part of the humanities uh, at NEH. Um, so a lot of you, uh, if you're doing work in the social sciences, in anthropology, sociology, political science, chances are that there is, um, there's, uh, um, um, there's money to be had uh, at NEH. Obviously, NSF also funds some of that kind of work as well. Uh, so, um, <coughs> We, we, uh, we fund project-based projects, and here uh, the point is really um, we don't do general funding. So a lot of times people say, I have this great idea for a center of something, and they just, and we, we need them to have a project, and I'll say to them over and over again, what is your project? But what is your project? <laughs> and that's really important. They have to have um, a discrete project to apply with. We don't provide general funding um, for things. Um, uh, and finally, we use peer review. And I know there's always um, uh, questions about what peer review is and is not. A lot of places use peer review. Um, so. Here's how we understand and some important things that I think you need to know about the way uh, we make our decisions. So first of all, peer review for us is advisory, uh, and it's the basis for all of our funding decisions. So at NEH, only one person can make a grant, and that's the chairman. Um, but uh, the applications that we get, all the applications we get, go through peer review. and at 
no point after they go through peer review are the re are the reviews separated from the application. So um, the chairman uh, will take the, the it, is, it is absolutely the most important step in uh, the process. Um, people often ask um, who, who uh, who's uh, part of peer review. Uh, yes, the, the, the people we get from out there to come in and review. Um, we also have a national council. Uh, they are considered peer reviewers as well. All of them use the criteria that we advertise uh, to make their decisions. Um, this brings up the question, which is one of the ones submitted. Um, who am I writing for? Um, and the, the simple answer there is, for every application you send to the NEH, you should always assume you're writing for a, an educated generalist audience. It is, uh, we will no doubt get specialists when we can to look at your application um, or to look at a set of applications, but at some point in the process you are going to be talking to people who aren't specialists. And so you need to, the register of your, uh, of your application needs to account for people who might not know your particular area. Um, we have, as I said, 100% turnover every year. It's open to all, and I give you a place you can sign up there, so, uh, which I mentioned already. So let's now talk about where, uh, where you need to look for the money. Um, NEH, as most agencies and organizations, no doubt Georgetown, has somewhere on its uh, website a mission statement. We have one as well. Uh, these are pulled right out of the mission statement. So uh, NEH uh, facilitates research and original scholarship. That's out of the division of research. That's the uh, division that I've been affiliated with for 20, 29 years. Uh, uh, I can't, that just, just, yeah. that's just <laughs> jarring to me, I can barely say it. Um, for 29 years. Um, uh, we're going to focus uh, as we go on, on on the division of research because most of you will be looking to apply there. Um, I am also going to mention though uh, these other places. So we're going to look at uh, NEH is interested in nurturing new ways of disseminating scholarship. So new ways, uh, not surprisingly, we're talking about the Office of Digital Humanities there. Uh, we're interested in teaching and learning, uh, what happens in the humanities classroom, and that's uh, the Division of Education. Uh, both of those places, uh, digital humanities and education programs, will have direct relevance, no doubt, to, to many of you. Um, there are other divisions that we will just touch on briefly, uh, preservation uh, and access, um, and uh, the Office of Challenge Grants and Public Programs. And finally, I'll also, we can never forget uh, the Office of uh, Federal State Partnership. So we have, uh, we have partners uh, in each of the states and uh, territories and uh, the district. Uh, they get about 40 or so percent of the money that comes to NEH. It's automatically through a kind of complicated uh, 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 equation uh, is given money um, so that they can uh, fund humanities programming at a very local level that's not really practical for uh, a national place like NEH to reach. Um, so they do a kind of thing that we don't, uh, but we give them the money to do it. So let's talk about research, division of research. Any questions before you're very, uh, you're a very quiet audience so far, <laughs> except when you're going for the humanities. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, maybe you'll mention this uh, in the later slide. Yep. But the Office of Challenge Grants yep. strengthen humanities institutions. Is that a source for uh, the general funding types of questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll sorry, I'll 
and it's supposed to stay in my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about challenge grants. They're um, a very sort of different kettle of fish than most of the other grants at NEH and what they require. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I will pause uh, there and we'll all come back. Okay? Thank you. So let's talk about the division of research. Um, the division of research is, um, it's a place I've called home for in roughly 29 years. and. Uh, we fund primarily in, in work that is in some ways interpretive. Um, even, even some major scholarly tools uh, like editions, translations, um, have an interpretive uh, component to them. Um, and so, uh, but you can think of the division really as um, in two parts. Uh, on one part is the division of, uh, or one part is uh, for individuals, individuals, and one of the things that's really weird in the government is that we actually give money to individuals that happens almost nowhere else uh, uh, that uh, Congress uh, has given us the power um, to actually write a check to you. Um, that means you can come to us uh, without checking in with your institution uh, in most cases. They don't like that when you do it, um, but, um, but, you're, but as far as we're concerned, we're dealing with you. The other half of the division of research is an institutional half, and there we're dealing uh, with large, you, not always large institutions, but institutions, uh, it means that the money is going um, to help support the institution as well. So we do things like uh, we encourage cost sharing, we uh, in, uh, pay IDC, uh, we pay, um, so there are things, uh, it's, it's a larger, but you can usually uh, do have a different kind of, you have a, they're more, the applications are more complicated, uh, but the opportunities are greater too. So let's look at some of these, and we'll start at the individual um, half. Um, so the main one, um, I'm not going to ask people to show their hands if you're planning to um, apply for a fellowship, but most people know us and will say things like, I received an NEH. Um, uh, it means that they've applied to the fellowships program. It has uh, an April 10th deadline, so it's on a lot of people's minds right now. That's why I suspect there are several of you out there who are thinking about applying for a fellowship. Uh, last year we moved the, the money scale up. What you're essentially applying for is time. So think about your application as, uh, as a request for time off uh, and time to get you out of the classroom, out of your administrative responsibilities, um, maybe to travel, uh, to, uh, to collections somewhere. Um, so uh, time, the number of months times 5,000 will tell you how much you're applying for. Um, it's my guess that uh, Georgetown, if you win a fellowship, and the, the, the rate is about one winner for every 12 applicants, um, but it's my guess that Georgetown tops off your salary. That's probably right. Can I usually? Yes. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that... Um, as, as, I mean, there's a process. It should be clear. There's a the process, process for requesting this yeah. topic, and, but there is a way to do it. And that's why it's always in your best interest to be talking to your institution Thank before you, you apply. Thank you. Uh, we have actually had some very sad cases where people have just decided not to talk, and then the school says, sorry, we're not topping off your salary. You can take it if you want, but you're not getting anything from us because you didn't talk to us before. Matt. Um, uh, just back to how the um, 
the check is, is paid. Can it can the funds be distributed to the direct the university directly? I know they mm -hmm. were many years ago, and sometimes that can make it easier. Yeah, ab absolutely. So it's it's your it's your money. You can tell us wherever you want it paid. We will pay it wherever you want it paid. So if you want it to go into your personal account, great. If you want it to be sent to the institution, which is often what institutions want, if they can touch the money, they can keep you know, your benefits going, right. and that kind of thing. Okay. That's fine. Yes, okay. yes, we're very flexible on that. About the only thing, and this is changing too, sometimes foreign banks um, are difficult um, dealing with individuals and foreign banks. Um, but, ma'am. What are the rules and restrictions on on combining so institutional and individual in more than one category and sequential or continuous? Yeah, great question. So the uh, and, and uh, uh, so I'll give you some some general guidelines and that will no doubt bring up all sorts of specifics and we'll just have to work through those. Okay, so let's, let's try not to get too bogged down in it, but. Um, if you're applying for a fellowship, you're applying for full-time work. And so if you are on some other kind of grant, some kind of institutional grant where maybe you're 10%. Um, so if you have 100% here, you can't have some other percent somewhere else. Usually we can, um, if you're lucky enough to be on multiple awards, we can make it work. <clears throat> um, there might be... Uh, situations where we ask you to, that you'll have to make a choice or step down from one. Now, if say for example, um, you apply for, as, as often happens, uh, you have a sabbatical coming up, so you apply to NEH, you apply to ACLS, you apply to Guggenheim, you apply, 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 and you're lucky enough and you win more than one. From our point of view, we don't care. If you, do exceptionally well, good for you. Um, if the other organizations might have, I, I know, you know, ACLS used to always say you have to take hours first. Okay. The only, the only thing that we are um, concerned about is if you can't, if you've provided us with a work plan, and this changes your work plan. And so we'll, but usually we can, usually we can work these things out. Okay, does that cover whatever scenario was in your, what's in your mind? More or less, and I assume that there's no restriction on applications being considered. Right, you're going to hear later this afternoon, NEA does have, a restri does have restrictions on how many applications they'll take from an institution each year. Um, we don't care, it's, it's wide open. And you should apply for as many things as you're eligible to apply for. Um, again, if, you're, if you uh, receive several awards, we might ask you to choose, but that's a nice position to be in. <coughs> okay. So, um, as sort of a, a subgroup of, of the fellowship program uh, is the NEH Mellon Fellowships. Uh, NEH Mellon Fellowships are for those of you who are working on the kinds of projects that uh, sort of will, will result in um, a digital product. There are a number of presses out there now, for example, um, that are publishing um, uh, elect, uh, digital, digital monographs. Um, and um, actually Mellon, uh, who is our partner in this, uh, and has just renewed uh, with a, um, uh, one, I think we have one point, I think they've given us $1.6 million to continue this, um, or $1.6 million overall. Um, Mellon has invested in uh, a number of presses, California, Duke, um, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of them, um, NYU, um, Michigan. These are all presses that have now digital monograph series. And for some of you will know that there are some things you just can't put in a book. Um, you can't put a, a music file in a, in a traditional book. You can't put a film clip in a, in a traditional book. 
but so these new formats allow you to do that kind of work. Um, and so we also, so they follow the same rules as our other fellowships, um, but um, so that's uh, another kind of fellowship. Um, you can all, you can apply for both the regular fellowships program and this one, um, but uh, you could apply uh, for one or the other, depending on what you're hoping uh, the result will be. Um, we also have a public scholar fellowship uh, program. Uh, public scholar, this was started about three years ago with sort of a sense that uh, we uh, need to meet uh, a larger, uh, that there is an audience out there of general educated readers um, who wanted to know, um, wanted well-researched works. And so we have the Public Scholar Program. Um, its deadline is in the first Wednesday of every February. Um, for those of you who are trying to write uh, your books as more general audience books. The fellowships typically, but not always, are more geared towards a scholarly audience. Um, uh, and then the Public Scholar uh, Program is, is more uh, focused on uh, the um, general audience. And then, sir. Just a quick question. Sure. Does it have to be a book? Or could it be a type project yeah. that's more digitally? So, so. yeah. So, uh, yeah, there was a time when almost everything we received was book only. Um, about the only place where that applies now is in the Public Scholar Program. Um, if you, uh, so there are some disciplines, for example, where a series of articles might be more appropriate than a book. Um, you, and we see that in the Fellowships Program all the time, in philosophy, for example, <coughs> uh, or anthropology. Um, they tend to, to work on articles and not in book, on books. Um, digital, other kinds of digital products frequently come to the fellowships program or to the Annie H. Mellon fellowships program. Um, they would not be eligible in the public scholar program. Again, that's for the traditional books. Yes? About, about the, um, the publishing, because it has to be um, a specific publisher for the public scholar mm -hmm. program? So you do not, uh, when you apply, you will, you do not need to have a publisher uh, signed up already. Um, uh, you don't have to be under contract with a publisher. Um, but what you'll need to do in your application, uh, because one of the things you're going to want to treat is your audience, um, give the reviewers a sense of what kind of publisher you're going to look for. So it's not, I would say probably a third of the applications we receive in the fellowships program have a publisher already. And that's great. If you have it, you should, you should mention that. Um, uh, but the, the applications that, um, or the applicants who don't have a publisher will frequently say, I'm hoping to publish with a university press that specializes in X, Y, and Z, um, and that's that's usually uh, enough. So it can be with an academic press? It can be with an academic press, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're applying for the Public Scholar Program, you're probably applying with a trade press, although the lines blur. So Oxford, for example, has a really um, uh, good public scholar kind of um, reach. Matt. You mentioned um, with this program and the um, and the fellowships that you're applying really for time. Um, are you looking for uh, specific ways that that time is going to be spent, yeah. or is time to write? Um, well, that's ex specific. expected as part of what that. What that um, so we will take um, an application uh, at any stage in your project's life. Um, Sometimes people will need time to go to archives 
and so they will write their their um, uh, work plan to reflect going to an archive, maybe they're there for three months, uh, doing this kind of research, that kind of research, that's great. Um, most people apply to us to do some amount of writing on their project, uh, and that's great. Um, but you probably will need to say a little bit more than, I'm going to write. So what are you going to write if you've given us that you have a five chapter book? Um, you know, what are you hoping to write during that time? Chapters three and four or something like that. So being specific is important, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, but uh, you, that's, um, but certainly for writing, for really any state, anything that you would do, you need to do to bring that to conclude to a conclusion. The thing we don't allow you to do right now is, um, well, we do in Public Scholar, but not in the others, um, is uh, work part-time. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, it's really hard for academics to get away, and uh, if we can provide um, support for you to say to your administrators, I need time off, <laughs> and I need time off to focus on my work. Um, we hope that our um, so being rather hard nosed on uh, that full time it will work to your advantage. I saw a hand up over here. Yeah, sir. Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, I do understand that nearly everybody here in this room is actually tenured, um, uh, but I'm actually a foreign PhD candidate who's actually not from Georgetown. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking a very out of the field question in the sense that if this were actually a, a dissertation and this is very much uh, work in progress where we're looking at a completion within a year and it's a non-American PhD, would this actually be entertained at all or basically just... Um, no, but probably for not for the reasons that you think. So, um, any, uh, our, the, the, the traditional division of labor between us and the Department of Education has always been we handle things after the PhD. So we don't fund, uh, we don't directly fund grad students. Mm -hmm. um, American, non-American, it doesn't matter. Um, we do fund uh, <coughs> foreign scholars um, to do work. They've had to have lived here for at least three years prior to um, submission. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, if so, if any of you um, aren't U.S. citizens but you've been living here for three years, you're fully eligible. We also support, of course, U.S. citizens who are working abroad and living abroad. So those are the kind of the parameters on, on our funding and what we're allowed to do, ma'am. So just a question to clarify, all the fellowship, for instance, if you're not American, you can't apply except if you need here for about three years. Yeah, three years, three year residency in the US, um, and then you're eligible. All right, so then the last one uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, quickly is the Summer Stipend Program. The Summer Stipend Program is essentially a fellowships program, um, but it's for, obviously, as the name suggests, for work in the summer. Uh, and um, the, the one twist here, and I, I might not even mention the, this program um, if it wasn't for this twist, but in order, if you are a tenure track faculty member, um, the only way you can compete in this is if your institution nominates you and you only get two nominations per year. Every school handles it differently. Jesse, I suspect that the nomination comes out of your office. Yes. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, uh, so, uh, this has a late September uh, deadline, but your, your school will have a different deadline. 
if you're a part-time faculty, a non-tenure track faculty, uh, an independent scholar, you can apply to us directly. You don't have to go through that nomination process. Okay. So those, those are the, the programs that we have for individual scholars. But um, a lot of times you can fund your own research by thinking more about how you can apply through your institution. And certainly in the Division of Research we have that. Um, we fund, for example, um, around the country, really around the world, um, fellowship programs at several institutions um, uh, such as the Newberry Library, uh, the Huntington Library, uh, the National Humanities Center, um, and other independent research uh, organizations. So a lot of these places have fellowship programs uh, that uh, supported by NEH. Most of them are residential. Um, in fact, all of them, I think, are residential. Um, the nice thing, or I think what the kind of the sexy thing about them uh, is the, uh, a lot of them uh, are around the world. So if you need to work in China or India or in the Middle East um, or in Italy uh, or Greece, um, there are centers all around the world, and we fund their fellowship programs. And what, what they can do that we can't do with our fellowships is they provide a community. Um, and so the residential piece is really important. You come together with other people who are working in those materials, uh, working on, in those areas of the world, uh, and it creates a kind of uh, intellectual community that produces, that uh, often produces something larger than just one person can do. So um, uh, you apply directly to these institutions. All of them can be found on our, on our website. Um, we also fund collaborative research. So uh, in three general areas, uh, obviously collaborative, you're going to need to be working with someone. Uh, the question will auto almost always come up, what if my collaborator is not at my institution? Or maybe my collaborator is, um, uh, is an overseas collaborator. Uh, can we fund overseas collaborators? Yes, they can be a part of the budget. They can't dominate the budget, however, and there's very specific guidelines for that. Um, can you work with someone at another institution? Yes, but uh, the, inst the, the application has to be submitted by one institution, one U.S. institution. So Georgetown would be obviously the, the, the logical one here. Um, first Wednesday in December, um, there are three different kinds. One uh, for publications. So if you are working um, to pull together a multi-author multi volume, um, if you're looking to, uh, you know, collection of essays, that sort of thing, that sort of thing, um, we, uh, we would certainly, uh, could certainly do that. We also uh, have a part uh, for convenings, which is a word that I hate, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it used to be called conferences, and that's what I, I still like, uh, want to call it. Um, so we, we fund uh, if you need to bring people together. So think of collaboration as something that happens uh, when you're all together there in the same room in a conference, um, for example, uh, or if you're working on something where you need to bring in people on a common topic. Um, that, is certainly, um, that is certainly a legitimate uh, project uh, for a convening grant. Uh, and then we fund archaeology, which has its own sort of separate uh, breakout because it's, it's sort of its own separate sort of thing. Um, but uh, we found a lot of archaeology around the world, uh, both uh, old world and new world. Uh, the grants are much larger. They're for a lot, lot longer time. Uh, and there's usually uh, IDC, so there's something <coughs> in it for your institution because they have to manage it. Um, so there is um, some kind of indirect cost for them. Um, but they're uh, a large, uh, much larger grant, so a $300,000 uh, grant is not uncommon at all. 
Um, sort of as a subset, uh, we have scholarly editions and translations. Uh, many people uh, know this program because um, of things like the presidential papers. We fund the George Washington papers, the Lincoln papers, the Adams family papers. Um, so uh, a lot of the sort of um, what uh, one chairman used to call the crown jewels of NEH. Um, uh, these, these major uh, efforts that if you do them once, um, we hopefully never have to do them again. Um, uh, but it's not just sort of um, uh, old dead white men. Um, we have uh, uh, literary folk as well, the Cather papers, the Twain papers. We have Martin Luther King. We have, so if there's any big, uh, 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 um, translation project or editions project here on campus. You probably already know about us, um, but there is a fair amount of money uh, here as well. Um, I should say collaborative research has a, um, a success rate, whereas the fellowships are about 1 in 12. Um, here we're looking at more like about 1 in 8. Um, so it's the, uh, the chances, if you are an numbers guy, um, look slightly better here. Um, I would say it's slightly more competitive, though. We get very few. Uh, um, these are the kinds of applications where you know everyone is putting together pretty, pretty good applications. So, <coughs> so questions about research. Will you be returning to the criteria for? Yeah. Okay. Were, were you the one that asked that question uh, about the criteria? No, I wasn't. Okay, so, yeah, when we talk um, a little bit about um, the application, okay. about how putting together an application, we'll talk a little bit about the criteria. One of the things that's really interesting, if you look at all of the NEH criteria across the whole endowment, we have what, something like 34 different grant programs or something like that. Our criteria are remarkably similar. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that as sort of a way to think about it. Um, Matt. Um, in the collaborative research program, um, would, you, um, would you accept a proposal that was for convening a group of scholars that were largely humanists, but not all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, the picture um, here yeah, is from is yeah. This is um, from a project that we funded, um, looking into the origin of AIDS, and it was it was uh, some um, some science folks, medical folks, social scientists, um, and humanists, um, all getting together and looking at um, sort of the the cultural beginnings of AIDS in right. Africa. So it was yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Sir, Jessica, so, I know your name. <laughs> <laughs> the summer stipends right. require an institutional nomination. Yep, sure does. Is there any other um, opportunity that is like that? There is no other opportunity like that. Um, uh, this, one of our goals with summer stipends is to make sure we provide opportunity um, to as broad a group as we can. Um, and so um, there was, I think, some fear when we, 1965, it's one of the original programs, uh, that, you know, that our one institutions would, would come to dominate. And uh, that hasn't, um, so the idea was, give everyone, you know, two nominees, every institution two nominees. Okay. So that's why, okay. as, uh, for, given that our, our sh uh, staff has also shrunk a bit uh, over the years, I'm grateful that, you know, the floodgates aren't open right now, um, and so every institution has two, but that's not the reason by any means. I think Georgetown always has its two nominees and does pretty well. I will. Yeah. You mentioned with the fellowships um, that the, 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 you're supposed to consult with your institutions, something like that. 
I think I might have misunderstood that. I thought this was the like the only institution only gets two. Could you say a little yeah. more? Maybe I'm asking yeah. someone from Georgetown to say more about what does that mean? So this uh, for this particular program, summer stipends only. Uh -huh. um, there is a nomination process. And so, yes, you're going to have to, even though it's an individual, it's, a, it's an award to you, uh, they, have a, they have a part to play, okay? For all the other individual awards, Public Scholar, Mellon, NEH Fellowships, um, those, um, we don't care, really. Uh, we're, we're agnostic on if, if you talk to your institution, but, you, I'll tell you from experience, you might be, um, you know, screwing yourself if you if if you don't. And so every institution is going to have a different um, a different requirement. Some will say, "Thanks for telling us. Go forth, do your thing." And some, you know, will will be charting that and budgeting for that and doing other things. It varies from institution to institution. We don't care. <laughs> so if, I'm sorry, uh, could I just yeah. add to, for the summer stipend, what we will do is we consider it a limited submission. So there are different funding agencies that limit the number of proposals that an institution can submit. So in this case, NEH limits us to two. So we would have an internal competition among people who are interested in that. And then there would be a committee within Georgetown that would submit, uh, select who would go forward to be the, the two, the, that would fill the two slots. I will just say, if, if I may, and I'm not speaking, although I work in the Office of the Provost now, I'm speaking on, uh, because of my past background, in the college dean's office. We like to know if you're going to submit the fellowship, largely because if you were to be awarded a fellowship, it means we have to address teaching, uh, you know, loss of your teaching time, et cetera. So it's not a requirement that you submit it through the office of research, but it is really helpful to know if you're going to submit it, either by telling the dean's office, well, certainly your department chair, Telling the dean's office and telling the research office is helpful because ultimately they will manage that um, because most people elect to have the money come through the university so that we keep your benefits package intact as opposed to the check going to your direct bank account. That's generally what people elect to do. So it's super helpful if you can just let people know. Um, and then we'll come back. Um, I'm just so um, I'm a full-time non-tenure line person. So, uh, but so for the summer stipend, I can just apply. This is what I understood from you. If you are non, if you are non-tenure track, yes. yes. So then I wouldn't be in that pool, right? I mean, I can let you know, but I because I'm going to put this out on our listserv so that people know that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I say the right thing. I'll come to you next, but after. Right back there. So this is another right. question about the summer stipends. How far in advance does Georgetown require the approval process to take place? So if the deadline is in September, then when do we have to submit? So we'll probably put out a call to the entire campus sometime in the summer, I think is what we'll probably do. In the summer? Yeah, June or really? July. And it's a it's an email that goes out to all faculty members. Um, so if, if you are going to submit, say, for a, a regular fellowship for a six-month or year-long fellowship, you don't have, you don't really have to put it through GU Pass, or you should put it through GU Pass. Uh, I would suggest putting it through GU Pass because then that will route it to your department chair, mm -hmm. and that will start the conversation if you haven't had the conversation yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the thing you need to remember, though, is. Unlike um, in an institutional grant, where someone on this campus actually has to hit the button mm -hmm. um, as your authorized organizational representative AOR, um, when you're in when you're submitting a fellowship application or a summer stipend application, you're submitting as an individual, so you have to actually go into Grants.gov and submit the application. Yeah. So. If you have to submit it through your institutions, think, don't think that they're going to take care of submitting it's it. It's gone to yeah. the NEH. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Um, okay. Sir. Yeah, are all the grants considered taxable income so part of it? We, we provide no tax um, 
uh, advice. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, there there is a uh, circular that's provided uh, by the IRS about how fellowships are taxed. Um, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, which is just another reason to have it go through your Georgetown or your institution because then, then it's all yeah. taken care of. Yeah. Ma'am. Yes. How are previous awardees treated if you have already received a grant or a fellowship? Uh, um, is it worth trying again? Oh, or okay. Um, so we treat them rather well. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the. So there are a couple of things that you need to know. So if you are if you're lucky enough and you win an app, you win an award. Um, uh, if you if you want another award for the same project, you have to read the guidelines very carefully because a lot of programs, the fellowships included, we don't allow you to uh, take two bites of the apple for the same project. Um, if you have had an award and then you, you start a new project, uh, it is fair for the panelists to ask what you did with that last award. If you said you were going to produce a book with the last award, did you produce the book? Um, and so that's, um, uh, so that, that's, that's what, so yes, you are eligible to a, to apply, in fact, we've had you know several people who have had multiple uh, fellowships over the course of their career, um, but they they need to show us that they've actually used the previous award successfully. And for another kind of support, for instance, if you get a fellowship and then you apply for this under stipend, yeah. then... um, <clears throat> it's always I think just think it's a good grant um, thing to remember that if you've been supported before. Um, that in 99 times out of 100, that's only going to work to your advantage. And so, you know, you want to um, make it clear that, hey, another group of reviewers thought my project, if it's at NEH or somewhere else, thought my project was worth supporting, and I got that money, and I used it wisely. Um, Panelists like to know that. It says something about will you complete this project successfully if they know you completed other projects successfully. If you've used money wisely before, chances are you're going to use money wisely again. So it, it should work to you. It's, it's so strange to me that people in the humanities, and this gets a little biblical, but um, <laughs> uh, like to hide their light under a bushel. Um, and so many times, um, they, uh, for whatever reason, for excessive modesty or something, um, they don't tell the, the panelists the things that really matter, that, about good things about you. So that's just, just something I just, just as a side note. So, some of the things that I, uh, okay, so let's get, uh, let's talk a little bit about education. So. In the Division of Education, um, we fund a lot of faculty members um, at, at the college and university level. And really, there, there are sort of, a two, um, sort of two ideas uh, behind the Division of Education uh, grants. Uh, one uh, is curriculum development kind of programs. The other is that they also want to fund uh, professional development. And professional development might mean some, some of your research, uh, or it might mean some of your, uh, the way you teach things. So um, they, they do, there are two uh, programs that you probably need to know about. One is called the Humanities Connections Grant. And this grant uh, has both a planning level and an implementation level, but it's designed to pull, pull together three courses um, from uh, different departments um, that 
sort of create a coherent cluster uh, for students. The idea here, there, there are a number of sort of ideas at work. One is that departments tend to um, be uh, the silos. And to kind of to break that down, uh, this is to try to, to get some kind of coherence across um, departments um, that might have faculty members working on things that are related in some interesting way. Um, and uh, one of the things that we do requ require is that there's at least one person, one course that you're trying to build that's outside the humanities. So um, if, if you were looking um, uh, to do a course in ethics, um, you could possibly pull in um, from, you know, if there's a better, uh, from, the, from the hospital here, you could pull in because there's a medical um, facility right here. So there, there are all sorts of different ways. And I, what I always tell people, if this is something that interests you, you should look at where you're, you should, the place to start is where you're, um, you have uh, sort of inherent strength uh, at your institution. So uh, obviously if you have, you know, if you have no one here who does film, um, you know, hardly likely, but um, if you had no one here who does film, you wouldn't try to put together uh, a project that included film. So think about where you're strong um, and think about ways you can create in interesting synergies um, on campus, um, ways to break down and to work with work across um, disciplines. Uh, and that, uh, that's the idea is that there's a planning grant um, to help you sort of begin that process of defining <coughs> what kind of uh, project you want and the implementation grant um, to actually do it. And it might, you know, these kind of things that, you know, they provide course, course release um, so you can do this kind of thing. Maybe it's bringing in speakers to help you understand um, what you need to do. Um, that are related. So there are all sorts of really uh, interesting uh, opportunities uh, with this program. It's relatively new, um, uh, and I believe that uh, again, its its funding is about one in uh, one in seven or one in eight. Um, I presume you don't have to go through a planning grant phase to do an implementation. Proposal. No, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's in, in a lot of our a lot of our programs are implementation have uh, both, both stages um, and you don't uh, you don't have to go through planning to do implementation um, maybe you've done that jumped through those hoops on your own uh, and that's yeah. um, what are the I guess where do these different grants have points of overlap for example if you have an education the humanities connections program but perhaps the implementation is through a digital platform um, would that go into the digital initiatives or would it come into education? Yeah. Um, when we get to the digital um, humanities um, section here, that will probably make more sense. But um, digital humanities for us usually means you're working on something, uh, a piece of software, or some kind of technology that's innovative, um, and you're actually developing. That's your focus. If you're trying to think of um, you know, a book that you would write and it would be on a digital platform or you're, you're thinking um, it probably belongs to one of the divisions and one of the <coughs> programs. Um, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The, for the Humanities Connections, what are the size of the grants and what's the period of performance? Um, uh, planning grant is, is a one year. Uh, implementation up to three years, um, thirty thousand for planning, uh, one hundred thousand for uh, implementation. And sorry, I meant if the deadline is September, when would it be that you would have to be undertaking the work? If you applied in September, the decision would be made right about now, um, and you would usually you could begin as early as. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of this, does so this, I'm not going to. The implementation oh. date that's here? Yes. Does that yes, determine? absolutely. Right in here. <laughs> um, it's coming to me. Um, so <laughs> so, it's in here. Uh, so the, that last column, project beginning. Okay. Okay, let's um, keep moving. Um, summer uh, the summer seminar program, a lot of people um, have participated in NEH seminars and, N and NEH institutes, uh, basically bringing uh, groups of faculty members together around a common topic. Um, those topics are usually announced in November, uh, and the instructions for how to apply uh, are, are included uh, with the announcement. Um, and, the, and the application date uh, is uh, almost always March 1. Um, uh, so you could, especially if you're a junior scholar, I would strongly encourage you to see if there's something for you to participate in and by junior scholars. Um, I think more than any other program that we have, this creates the kind of uh, network uh, that will last you your entire uh, career. And so uh, if you do a seminar, that's because you have a research interest in a topic. If you choose an institute, it's because you have a teaching interest in that topic. And so the discussions are slightly different. Usually they're around major research libraries. Um, uh, are sort of the centers for these things, which means uh, Georgetown um, would actually be a very good place to do uh, a seminar or institute too. So if you're interested in proposing one um, for either college teachers or K through 12 teachers, um, uh, that is certainly an option here as well. So, yeah, yeah, you mentioned that this is an ideal program for junior uh, scholars. Uh, is the three-year residency in the U.S. a thing here too? Because uh, some junior scholars are not necessarily coming from the U.S. when they start. So just curious about that. I I believe the three-year rule is in play for these as well. Across. The, and I the believe that is part. that is right. Thanks. I could be wrong, but um, but I, I'm I'm fairly certain of that. Um, just to clarify, for the it says for projects in 2020 for directors, that that means if you have a subject that you'd like to yes. leave one in, you apply in by March 1st, and then the NEH announces which ones have been chosen, whether or not you've been chosen. Yeah, you number. would find out um, in July if you've been chosen, uh, and then um, you have essentially. Uh, it's for the following summer. Um, it, confusingly, you also apply March one if you want to participate, but that's for the for the fall for the summer. So if you uh, for March first, twenty nineteen, if you wanted to participate in the summer of twenty nineteen, you would. Um, but if you applied to us to direct one in twenty nineteen, that would be for the summer of twenty twenty. These are only located in the U.S. right now, right? Uh, they used to be elsewhere. Uh, I was wondering if you yeah, were debating um, that. Uh, yeah, we get that question all the time. Yes, so the, there was some sort of high profile. Uh, lots of people know that we used to do these around the world, uh, and that has ended. Uh, it, um, there, there has been a considerable amount of talk about um, bringing them back um, on a, some kind of limited basis. But I, I, I'm, not, I'm just not involved in the division of research in, in those kinds of discussions. So. Is there a way that we can advocate for that kind of thing? I can't uh, encourage you oh. to advocate. Okay. Um, that's right. um, if you if you find a way, and that, if that's something that's meaningful you from, uh, meaningful to you, and you want to um, you know, do that, that's okay. that's your business. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I, I can say that I have done two of these summer programs, uh -huh. one when I was a middle school teacher and one when I was a, um, I was a post-tenure, uh, a pre-promotion professor here, and they both really uh, changed the way that I taught and researched, and so I would 
really highly recommend uh, participating in them, and I'm now thinking about um, proposing uh, to teach one. So they're really they're really fabulous, and they're really really fun. And both of the ones that I did were out of the United States. Uh, so, um, so <laughs> but um, but I think even if they had been in the United States, they would have been wonderful. So I would highly encourage. Uh, participating in them. They're really, really amazing. And I, from what I've heard, uh, these, the connections that you make, the people you're there with, remain sort of in your, uh, in your circle for, for a lifetime. Um, so it's really, um, well, there's one more hand that went up and we'll take it and then we really need to sort of keep moving. So. Yeah. I'm sorry to ask okay. again about the residency. I would like to know how do you count residency? Is it based on visa? Is it based on, on, on how did you, because for instance, some people were in the US in a, in a specific visa as a postdoc researcher and then, so how do you, if you? It's, it's really based on residency. So if you count your primary residency in the US continuously for three years, then you qualify. So how you're here on what kind of visa in some ways doesn't matter to us. It's residence. So some people, you know, they've been here as a student uh, and then get a job here and maybe the visa changes uh, in that time. Um, that's fine. It's, it's really that your primary residency is here. If you are here for a while and then you move back, I move somewhere else outside the U.S. for a, a you know, for a period uh, and your residency, your your primary residence is no longer in the U.S., um, then you have to start over. Yes? The same point here, does that apply to green card holders as well? Yes, yeah, it's, it's residency, so I... Um, and do citizens too? Uh, no. no, U.S. citizens are, are uh, eligible regardless of where. Okay, uh, I'm going to just mention that the, um, are there people here who are involved in digital humanities? Um, okay, good. Um, the Office of Digital Humanities has essentially sort of two kinds of, of grants. One uh, for um, um, sort, of, uh, sort of what we might call teacher training, um, to bring people together in workshops on uh, particular issues in the digital humanities. These work very much like the seminars and institutes in education, only these are for digital. Um, they also have advanced, what's called an advancement grant. Uh, and uh, that one is uh, at sort of two, there's a phase one and a phase two. Phase one, so implementation and, and planning. Um, the idea is uh, if, uh, you basically, once you've had two awards for a project, you're done, <laughs> um, in a nutshell. Um, you need to be working where the technology is your focus. If, for example, you're really interested in um, the papers of Mark Twain, and you think, gosh, it would really be helpful to um, uh, put this material online. That probably doesn't make the grade in digital in the Office of Digital Humanities. If you said, I want to create a piece of technology that editions can use to take print and uh, put them, make them easily digital um, out of print. Um, so that, that probably would, because there the focus is on the technology. Okay? Um, so uh, there are all sorts of uh, activities then uh, that are uh, supported by uh, the Office of Digital Humanities. So software uh, kinds of things, international collaborations. There's a lot of them in this area. I should say that the I, really the driving be, idea behind the Office of Digital Humanities is that there's risk. And the grants business is inherently conservative. That is, um, uh, especially in the federal government, we get money. Um, we have to show a payoff 
to taxpayers. Um, but we know that a lot of the most interesting work that's going on out there um, requires some risk. Sometimes projects don't pay off. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we have an Office of Digital Humanities, because part of their mission is to look and to take <coughs> risks um, in a way that might not be easy to do um, in the regular programs. Uh, I'll just mention here that we do have a division of uh, preservation and access. So if you uh, are at a, a library or an archive um, or a museum and you have uh, material culture uh, or something that you want to preserve, um, uh, there's, there's uh, many ways of um, uh, getting money to do that at NEH. Uh, we had a, a, t a different chairman than the curse of being around a place for a long, long time. So um, we had a, 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 a chairman who used to call this the division of Ken Burns. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, the division of public programs um, is, I mean, the, the really sexy thing that, that you know, NEH does is produce those, those um, you know, the Civil War and uh, baseball and jazz and those things. But the Division of Public Programs does a whole lot more than that. So it's a lot of um, uh, media, uh, public programs, um, uh, reading programs, and other kinds of things um, come through the Division of Public Programs. Um, also digital, uh, they do actually have their own digital program. Um, so for example, if you were developing uh, a web tool to do Georgetown history, sort of a, a walking tour that you know was on an app, um, that would be fully eligible um, through their uh, um, digital programs um, for the public. Um, and uh, you can see they, they also have everything there is development and imp uh, development uh, development and implementation. Um, one of the things I will say, if you are interested in producing um, uh, something like a documentary or some other kind of media program, you should be talking to these people right away. Because um, everything I know about public programs, um, not only at NEH but in other places, is that the, what we mean by implementation stage or by planning stage is very different than what uh, Whiting means by it or some other institution means by it. So make sure you are um, talking to them at an early place, okay? Someone asked about challenge grants before um, and um, uh, the Office of Challenge Grants provides money uh, for these are major fundraising efforts. Um, they get their money, it's called treasury money, uh, and it can only be accessed by you raising uh, um, money. Uh, it's for infrastructure. Um, that can be a material infrastructure, so if the library was doing some kind of building. Um, but it uh, can also be kind of uh, you know, thinking about sustainability of a digital project, um, perhaps. Um, is another way of, of thinking about uh, that infrastructure. Um, challenge grants, uh, if you're going to do this, these are in some ways the most compli complicated application that we have. Um, and so you need to be talking to um, uh, Sarah, one of the members of the collaborative team, pretty early. Um, uh, it also means that you have to have your uh, fundraising folks um, lined up um, by the time you come in uh, with an application. I don't see that here. Am I just um, I'm sorry. Um, so it's right now, um, it's in the Division of Preservation and Access. Oh, okay. Thank you. And it's the very last one, Infrastructure and Capacity Building. Thank you. Um, technically, I think we still have an office of, of challenge grants, but sort of in the sort of period of downsizing and things right now, that's where they are. 
So um, that, but it's the, yeah. And then I'll just mention that uh, every, uh, if you're a Virginian, uh, the Virginia Humanities Council, DC has a Humanities Council, Maryland has a Humanities Council. If you are interested in the way humanities is pursued at a local level, um, in local programs, um, you should get involved. Um, each council will have their own set of grants, so you'll just have to look to see maybe there's something for you. All of them want to do something um, that will that will use volunteers or other kinds of scholars, um, uh, and so get involved. They're they're good. They do vital work for the humanities. Um, uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're absolutely worth a look. Um, okay, questions on NEH structure? Good. Uh, I know you're not good, but uh, <laughs> yeah, let's move on. Um, so let's talk about putting together an application. Um, one of the things that, um, I, I won't stray too long. Um, one of the uh, things I've provided is um, a narrative of um, a sample application. Um, and one of the, if we had uh, another hour or so, um, we would probably do what we call a mock panel. And I, would, I would have given these to you, uh, given uh, samples to you ahead of time. We would have read and we would have actually run a, a peer review panel on some applications. And that's, that's always great fun. Um, it takes a little time, though, and, but it's, I think it's worth it. So I was trying to think over the weekend, well, with the time that we have, what could we do that would be useful? And um, so what I did is I took uh, an application that I like very much. Um, uh, I've known Danielle for a long time. She's been a panelist for me. Um, and I, uh, so it's a, it's a sample. Uh, it's just how she wrote an application that worked for her. And what I've done is I've, just with my own notes, I've diagrammed, I think, what she's doing. Because I think she, I, I think it's kind of in some ways sort of classically, a classically formulated application. She's hit all the bases here, which is well, probably why I was funded. So if you didn't grab one on the way in, grab one on the way out. Um, uh, or, or we can pass them around. There's, there's also up here uh, a blue sheet uh, that has tips, which is sort of the accumulated wisdom of several people uh, in the division of research. Um, so let's talk about, I mean, just very quickly, and I won't labor a lot of these points. Um, grant writing, uh, success in grant writing uh, is usually, uh, the, the people who are successful are usually the most organized. And it's because, it's because grant writing requires you to know so much in advance of what you need to do. Um, if you need next semester off or next uh, academic year off, if you have a project, if you have sabbatical coming up, chances are you're too late <coughs> already. So um, a lot of times uh, people miss deadlines because they're just not organized. And so organization uh, will will um, uh, will will give you a leg up. Uh, and you, you're lucky you have folks here on campus who help keep you organized. So I have a question about the period that the mm -hmm. year-long grants apply to. They apply to calendar years, not academic years, correct? No. OK. <laughs> um, so if you apply on April 10th, which is the deadline, you will know in late November or early December if you've won. Theoretically, you can begin, I believe it still is January, um, 
February. You can begin as early as February 1. You could actually begin as late as September 2021. Basically, you have an 18-month window to begin. But every grant is going to be different. Um, there's the, and so that's why you just have to be organized. Um, you know, on my laptop, I keep oh, um, I keep an Excel file of of grants that I think will apply to me sometime. And usually, I find those because I'm reading acknowledgments in books, and I'm thinking this is a pretty good book. Who funded this? Um, and, and then I go out and I find, you know, when is the application deadline? When do I find out and when can I begin? And, I, and I, I'm constantly charting that, even though, you know, right now I don't have a project to apply. Sometime I will. Um, so um, I say make use of your help. So here's, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, um, we do provide the sample application, the sample application that, um, people have now. Um, that is just from the website, plain and simple, and we have hundreds of them up. Um, so, and for all programs. So we provide those. Um, I mentioned access to program officers. There is a database where you can look to see if you're interested to know which of your colleagues have, um, uh, here at Georgetown, have received a particular kind of an, a kind of a, an award. Um, that is available to you using the database or uh, more likely you're interested in what's been funded in your area, you can look for that. For a lot of programs, we will read draft applications, um, especially the institutional programs. Um, usually it's about you have to send us something within six weeks of the, before the deadline, um, but we will read drafts. That does not, that is not true for fellowships. Um, that's simply a, a workload issue, 1,200 applications. We couldn't possibly read that many drafts. Um, uh, and we do provide then uh, decisions um, after the fact uh, about well, why uh, we've made a particular decision. Um, I think I've, um, I've mentioned just about everything else there. So. The first thing you really have to do is figure out how to make your case. And that's something before I asked about the criteria. All of our guidelines right up front mention the criteria by which we are going to evaluate your application. When we pull together a panel, the first thing we do is we walk them through those criteria. Uh, when they come to, the, to Washington uh, to meet, we will talk about the criteria. Everything, um, when we say those are the criteria for selection, we mean it. Um, therefore, it is, if you're putting together an application, pay attention to the criteria. Learn them. Practice them in your sleep. Um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, because uh, it matters. And if we say we're interested in significance and we use that word significance over and over again, it's probably a good idea when you're talking about significance in your application that you're telling us, here's where I'm talking about significance. Because what happens is panelists come together around a table to talk about your project. And you want them talking about your ideas. So if one says, oh, I didn't see a real good argument for significance, um, they'll know exactly where to look. Where, where do you think you're making that argument? So, um, you know, you can structure your application really however you want, but those criteria are important. And that's what we're asking people to look at. Um, I'm gonna, I'll come back to you uh, in a minute. So, all criteria, so I just did a, just a, I, this, this is not only at NEH, I would add ACLS here. Um, I looked at uh, American Philosophical Society. We all have, we all have posted some kind of criteria for evaluation. They're all the kind of, the, uh, they're all kind of alike. One is the topic, or the, the project. 
Is it worth doing? Um, we call that significance. We want to know the significance of your project. And for almost every uh, granting agency, that's always the first one. It's always the first one at any age because honestly, it, if you can't, whatever your project, if you can't uh, explain why it's worth doing, um, none of the other things matter. If you have a great work plan, but it's not worth doing, who cares? Um, that is the main thing you have to jump through. On that sample that I've given out, what I love about that sample is in three different places she makes three different kinds of arguments for significance. So the first one she mentions is that this one, this has never been done before. Okay, um, that's great. By itself, that's not enough. Um, just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean that it should be done. <laughs> um, so, but, but that's one, so there's one piece. So you should think about your project and really why it should be done. And you should have, there should be multiple ways of understanding that. Um, looking at scholarship that's already been done, for example, might help you understand where you fit in into some kind of larger scholarly um, um, discussion. Um, we want to know about you. Your, uh, we require your, your CV, on, and so it's not a blind review. Um, so are you able to do the project? Uh, and it's important that your narrative um, not be completely separate from your CV. Um, think of uh, what I suspect happens often, and maybe this is a reflection of just the way I work, um, is that people spend a lot of time on that narrative, and they get it just right, they keep whittling it down until they reach the page limit, they you know, get everything and they're happy with that, and then they slap on a, a, a CV and they, you know, the, the other things get sort of slapped on. If you're smart about this, your, your narrative and your CV are in dialogue in some way. That is, um, if you have something that is, that you really want the panelists to see in your CV, uh, and you know they're reading 40 applications, chances are you better tell them about it in the narrative. So there is a kind of dialogue that happens between um, your CV and your narrative. Your CV doesn't speak for itself. Um, if you've done something really great and you've just listed it, um, you can trust that the panelists are going to figure out why that's important, or you can tell them why. So keep in mind what's in your CV should, the, the important things should in some way be reflected in your narrative. Um, okay, just, I'm gonna, just let me get through this and I'll, um, okay, let's go here. Um, right. Just a question about um, to what extent we should be trying to strategize the narrative. So for example, I'm working on a project that involves three different regions of the world. The uh, American taxpayer cares a quite a bit about one of those regions, not at all about another one, and moderately about a third. Intellectually, I would frame this as a sort of equal sort of, but uh, because of this, I could also frame it as uh, ex, you know, emphasizing That's lots an easy of interest to taxpayers. Don't spin your project. Okay. Don't spin your project. Panelists might not know what you're doing, but they're really good at saying, something's not quite right here. Or maybe a letter writer writes in uh, and gives his or her spin on your project, which is different. Um, and then suddenly, when they're, when they're seeing that, that things don't seem quite right, they've stopped talking about your good ideas. Um, if you're working on a project, trust that it is, trust it. And um, uh, don't try not to um, try to figure out. Yeah, you know, will NEH like this? And people always say, "Well, what does NEH want?" Um, mm -hmm. We want the best projects, and that's not. Um, yeah, you can't. 
manipulate that. So be honest to your project. Now I'll go back here. Um, it's about the, the aspect of the, one of the criteria that um, I've seen in your publications, but you haven't showed it here, which is about how projects should not have an ideological investment. They shouldn't be promoting something. Right. One reason I ask about that is, I'll be honest, I had an NEH um, grant rejected. Um, I also won one, so I'm happy about that. But it was rejected because I think your scoring system can give a great deal of power to one person. One person gives it a very low score, it's really out. And this one was for, and I'm a medievalist, I work on anonymous texts. I was arguing that this text was written by a woman. And this reviewer said, this is a feminist project. She's pushing an idea that, uh, you know, so, so there's an ideological slant here. And that was the, the, the comments which were very helpfully conveyed to me. Uh, some of you did not receive the grant. But I just wonder how you train your reviewers to address that issue and how we can best write an application that is coming from, say, a perspective that, uh, you know, so <laughs> that's, that's promoting um, a case. Yeah. But so um, can, we, can we handle that when we get yes. to the bottom? Sure. Yeah. OK. So, um, because there's a lot to unpack there. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, there's almost always a criterion about the application, the quality of what you submit. So is it well written? Um, do you follow the instructions kind of thing? Um, there's always something about your plan of work. So have you told us what you're going to do with the money? Uh, and then um, your product, what's going to be produced, and what's your plan to bring this this to conclusion? Um, and so, for our grants, typically you don't need to bring the whole project to a conclusion by the end of the grant, but you better tell us what your plan is. When the money runs out, how are you going to, how are you going to get this across the finish line? So um, not okay. So now that all of that is said, um, I will come back to this this question about um, uh, there. There are things that we don't talk we don't cover in the criteria. But um, one of them is advocacy. Um, or uh, uh, so if if you're doing something that is um, uh, driven by policy or political point of view, we, uh, we don't fund that. Um, uh, this is slightly different because you're, you have, um, you have, and that is not, um, you know, we, we fund a lot of feminist scholars. Um, it might be, uh, I, I would have to look at your, the application to try to, try to figure this out. But um, maybe they thought it had created a blind spot, or that was their concern. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I can't really, so it's hard for me to know exactly how this, um, why this panelist case. I would, if I were in a, a panel and that came up, I would have probably asked the panelists to um, to clarify the point um, and make sure he clarified it in, or her, him or her in, the, in comments so that it would make more sense. Um, it also, I would dispute a little bit that one panelist gets a lot of power. Um, the staff, we don't blindly take what the panelists have done and in fact we're constantly trying to see what, you know, was was this application treated fairly? Was this one treated fairly? Do we need to go back and look at this one uh, another time because of some comment that seems out of place? Um, those are all things that, that we do. We work very, very hard to make sure we get that right. Do you give feedback on rejected applications? Yeah, absolutely. You do? Yes. In fact, we invite you to ask for it in the rejection letter. Um. What are the other? Okay. <laughs> uh, so we're likely going to resubmit a proposal um, that would be a, that'll be an institutional proposal, and um, for other agencies where I've submitted proposals, 
Um, they encourage you to respond early in the proposal to respond directly to the comments you received on the rejected proposal and how you've addressed those. Is, th is that helpful in these applications or, yeah. or not? If we want you to, so every application that comes to us is considered new. Okay. So you don't need to tell next year's panelists that you uh, applied okay. unsuccessfully. However, um, you know, that is one of the things that staff does. Um, you know, did you account for, you know, Okay, but it so doesn't have to be explicit. It does not have said, to example, be explicit, but. You basically say, they said this, here's what we've done. Yeah. So we don't need to I, I personally actually find that a bad strategy, okay. simply because um, I don't think it's ever a good idea to tell panelists that you've been unsuccessful well, before. Right. But even though they know, um, you know, a lot of our, um, a lot of the things that they they're they're looking at Are have seen. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about the work plan and what mm -hmm. how what level of detail you should go into? Kind of for the summer stipend, it's easy to say I'm going to write chapters two and three, but yeah. when you have a whole year and you have a whole book to write. Like, what level of specificity do you need? Um, well, we want to know, you know, basically what you're doing with your time. So, if you're doing multiple things, I would suggest breaking it up by, by the months um, and explaining exactly what you're going to be working on. So, um, well, the, the, the sample there does an okay job. I wish she had done actually a little bit more with her work plan, but she explains she's basically chopping her work her her work into three parts, um, and she's you know doing research for some part, blah 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 blah. So um, I, I think that you, know, you you don't have to give us you know exactly what you're looking at, what box number in the archive you're pulling. Um, but you know we need to know you know if you're going into the if you're going into an archive what are you going there to find out what kinds of what are the questions that are driving what you're going to do how long do you think you're going to need if you're going to write what are the things you're going to look to write um, is it you know are you looking to do an article that will be the basis for chapter four um, you know but so. You, it, it, there's no right answer to, in some ways for uh, a workshop or for a um, work plan um, because it varies from, from, in, from project to project to project to project. But give us as, much, as many specifics as <coughs> we can. Patrick. Uh, thanks so much. I have a question actually about this Remember Your Audience. Um, and and the generalists, you mentioned that they're educated generalists, and I just wondered if you could explain that a bit. Is that yeah. generalists, humanists, generalists, yeah. academics, or really ministers, presidents of Elks clubs, who just have, right, who are educated people and want to be involved? Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, we're really, we, we have a panel at Elk studies. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, so it's going to vary from program to program, and that's because, um, like in fellowship, you get 1,200 applications. Um, I am, I, I can say with almost 100% certainty, you probably get between 30 and 40 in British literature. Okay. And so if so we, we can, if we can, to break things up by disciplines or related disciplines. Um, and so there will be, uh, especially if you apply to the research division, some level of um, um, specialist review. Um, if you apply in digital humanities, um, maybe they're breaking theirs up by kinds of technologies. So. Why did I get this example? I don't know any kinds of technology. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they might divide theirs up in a slightly different way. But the National Council on the Humanities is a group of 26 citizens who oversees what we do, uh, what the panelists do. They are people who have 
humanities credentials. They're all sort of established scholar. A lot of them are established scholars um, or filmmakers or other kinds of, of people in the humanities. And they're going to be looking over this stuff too. So that's why I say everyone um, will have generalist readers. Okay. Um, and it's sort of generalist humanities type. Okay. Behind this, though, is sort of a larger concern that, you know, any taxpayer, any member of Congress um, can ask to see what we funded, and we have to supply it. And we want them to be able to look at that application and say, okay, I don't know much about, you know, uh, Aramaic, but I can see that there's something, you know, good, interesting work going on here. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, um, some things about your audience um, uh, here, um, I think that they're all fairly, uh, cert those are fairly um, straightforward. Um, most of the time, if you're applying as an individual, there's no budget, um, so that's a good thing. Um, but if there is a budget, uh, you need to, you should absolutely be talking to us about what goes into that budget. Um, we do provide sample budgets and whatnot to make sure that you are not asking for money that you can't, can't take. Um, uh, usually we ask, in most programs, we ask panelists to give us advice on the intellectual quality of your work. Um, if your budget is a mess, and let's face it, sometimes budgets are a mess, um, but you have a really great idea, we will... Um, uh, we will work that out with you if you're funded. So we don't we don't get too too hung up on budgets. Are the odds different if you're if you're applying for the, a fellowship? Um, if you're applying for less money as opposed to more money, thirty versus sixty. No. What you need to do is tell us how much time you need, and just and the, the 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 challenge is the same. If you're asking for six months, you have to justify six months of you. Applying for eight months, you have to justify eight months, a year. So, um, the, it's that justification. Um, I'm going to end here um, with three grant truths. <laughs> and um, one, if you don't apply, you won't be funded. Obviously, um, that's um, I was ordered to say that. <laughs> um, um, one and done is a losing strategy. Um, I would say half of our applicants, they come in, they apply, they get rejected, and they decide, oh, I take this personally, so I'm not going to apply again. And that's not a good strategy. We know, um, statistically, you're more likely to be funded um, if you come back. Um, why? Because you've put together an application before, you've thought about the application more, so um, don't be a one and done kind of person. Um, there's nothing personal about being, uh, I have a good friend uh, at uh, a place um, who actually it, it took him eight, eight, eight tries to get his application funded, uh, but he was persistent uh, and uh, he, he did get funded. And it's excellent project. Um, and then the other one is the guidelines tell you almost everything you need to know. We get beaten up sometimes for including in our applications a lot of information. But it's really designed to handhold you through the process. Um, so use that material, use that, that resource, even if you don't want to call us, you don't. Um, use the guidelines because they tell you what you need to know um, and um, so. That would be number of words, images, words. Yeah, all of that. It's all in there. Um, what you need to cover, uh, what your resume needs to, to, to have, what the panelists are going to be looking at in your resume, Meaning and in here. all of that. No, the guidelines, okay. um, the guidelines are on the website. Okay. Okay. Um, so any, any program, any program you're interested in, if you're into, if you want to apply for a fellowship, you're going to go to the website and download, download the guidelines, or as they're now called, 
help me, folks. Um, NEH Funding folks. Opportunities. I'm sorry? Funding opportunities. Funding opportunities. Mm -hmm. So the, the funding opportunity is listed there with the conference. So. All right. Um, so we're five minutes after, and I'm sh uh, Jesse, uh, I was, yeah. yeah, so we're five minutes long. <laughs> um, uh, my card is up here. If you have any questions, you shouldn't hesitate to give me, um, drop me an email or give me a call. If I'm not the right person to talk to, I'll be happy to get you to the right person.